and uh, one of the most brilliant minds and uh, heads, in a sense, of uh, the intellectual world, Richard Baldwin, discussing about his ideas on uh, this globotic upheaval that will hit the world of, of economics, of labor, of, of, uh, uh, of business in, uh, in the next uh, days, uh, years, uh, Richard uh, is a serial killer on uh, the topic. So he started a few years ago, actually many years ago, arguing about uh, the evolution of labor. Uh, but I want to, to introduce Richard's uh, last uh, book, which is the topic of today, of tonight, uh, starting with the previous one, because the story is not over. Huh? And the previous book was The Great Convergence. And he stated a fundamental uh, argument about the, these three constraints, these three steps, okay? The end of cost of transportation that changed the market for goods that happened a few years ago. The change uh, in the cost of information that has changed the market for gray colors, for, for knowledge, and the coming uh, dropping of cost of relation. That is the change in the market of labor and uh, the coming up of robots everywhere, also for white collar. So welcome in the world of white robots coming over and challenging our way of organizing businesses, activities, and, uh, uh, and institution, I would, I would say. So is uh, this global uh, upheaval of robotic labor uh, a threat, a great opportunity? Um, a segment of activity and not the whole story. This is what Richard is uh, willing to illustrate us for, for, uh, for tonight. Uh, I'll give Richard uh, 20, 25 minutes to uh, explain the, the argument of this last book. But again, Richard, starting from the previous one because it's, it's a continuing story. And then I'll open our discussion for questions. I already have three questions here in line. You're, you're invited to add yours. I have mine, and I'll keep them for the end to challenge Richard for his beautiful, great, grateful, uh, great contribution to discovering the future uh, ahead of us. Richard, you have the floor, and expect to be challenged by the Copernicani after your speech. Richard, please. Well, thank thank you very much, Carlo Alberto. Uh, I'm very kind words of introduction, I appreciate that. And also I'd like to thank the association for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with this uh, audience. I'm looking very much to the feedback. I'm hoping to be challenged mm -hmm. because of course that's when I get new ideas and the next book comes along. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, also, I would like to say, I'm sorry I can't be with you, but really sorry. I, I love going to Italy. I love going to these kinds of meetings. The little exchange you have in the margin, in the coffee or the wine afterwards, that's what that's, really makes it yeah. worthwhile. <laughs> and let's hope that this is not the future. It's just a little hiccup. But uh, in any case, I'll, I'll write another book and then you can invite me back in 2021 or 20. But anyways, what I'm going to talk about tonight is this. This is the Italian version of it, of it um, published uh, Il Molino. Um, and it's, let me just switch over if I can share my screen. Uh, I'm an economist, so I'm actually- So you're not supposed to do anything about technology, of course. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I was going to say I'm powerless without PowerPoint, so- <laughs> I'm going to go with the uh, PowerPoint is the coronavirus of intellectual minds. So <laughs> we shall we shall really have a, a vaccine for that anyway. Well, well let's see. You know, see if you like my slides. So, sometimes slides are terrible, yeah. sometimes they're, they can be OK. So let's look like that. a Microsoft presentation. So perfect. But bellissimo. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the book Globotics Upheaval, Globalization Robotics and the Future of Work. And it came out in 2019, way before COVID. But my mind, and, and quite a number of people are writing about this now, the arguments I make have been accelerated by COVID. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, in details. But let's get going on this whole thing. This slide is my argument. And it explains the word globotics. So look at this digital technology area, arrow. That's huge. It's changing everything. It's coming incredibly fast. Digital technology is 
changing the world, disrupting the world, building things, tearing things down. But in particular, it's launching these two other little blue arrows, automation and globalization. At the same time, driven by the same digital technology, but this time it's affecting white collar and professional jobs, not factory jobs. Automation and globalization are very old stories, but up until fairly recently, it has mostly been affecting manufacturing, mining, and agriculture, stuff you could put on a boat. This new tendency of digital technology is making automation of office jobs possible and globalization of office jobs possible. And so it's gonna hit white collar and professional jobs, not just manufacturing jobs as has been in the past. Thus, I think the future of globalization and automation going forward another two, five, 10 years will be very unlike the globalization and automation we've known in the past. And I think there's quite a systematic misthinking in the public debate using analogies from the past where automation meant industrial robots and globalization meant ch competition from China. To think about the future, which will be the automation and uh, internationalization of office jobs. And I would argue that it's coming faster than most think and in ways few expect. So that's the book. Maybe we should just stop and have questions now. <laughs> no, actually, I've got a lot of slides. So uh, I'd like to show you the slides. I spent a lot of time on the slides. Okay, so here we go. This is how I want to start out, especially for the Copernicans. The future's unknowable, but also inevitable. And I like to bring that up because we are talking about the future. And this slide reminds you and reminds me that when you talk about the future, you're just making it up. You can use logic, but you honestly are making it up. And I have this very bad habit of sounding like I believe everything I say. So you should know that I know it's not true. It may or may not come through. But since the future is inevitable, we as economists have an obligation to use our knowledge, our specialized skills, our wisdom, patterns from the past to think about the future. Because the worst way to think about the future is to pretend it's gonna be like today. And that I'm, I think is what a huge amount of the thinking about the future of work is driven by. And that's why I'm worried and I wrote this book. So let's just dive into it. Let's start with some definitions. Globotics, it's globalization and robotics smashed together into an ugly, but hopefully memorable word. I've had, I had that honor of having my book reviewed in quite a few places like the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, New York Times, and all of them pointed out what an ugly word globotics is. And I'm going like, yes, that's right. I want you to remember that it's both at the same time because the public discourse is either about globalization and offshoring and outsourcing, or it's about robotics. And I think we need to be talking about them both at the same time. So when I talk about globalization in this talk, I'm gonna be talking mostly about telemigration, which is another word I made up because I wanna break your mold of thinking about offshoring service jobs. And I'd like to call that RI for remote intelligence. Now, when I talk about robotics, I am not gonna be talking about industrial robots, which is what most of us see all the time in our news feeds, they're very sexy um, images, you know, these Boston Globe Dynamics, think dog-like robots. Everybody is so fascinated by those things, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about white collar robots. And I would call that AI for artificial intelligence. And I wanna play off the remote intelligence and the artificial intelligence changing the future of work for office and professional jobs. That's where I wanna go with this. So telemigration, quite simply, it's people sitting in one nation working in offices in another. It's telework but from another nation. It's remote work done by foreigners. And I would make a slight distinction between the classic offshoring of jobs that we've seen so much, which is say call centers or sending off work to do logo designs. What I'm thinking is that foreigners will participate in our offices, in our remote teams as in a live fire action. So right now, many of us are teleworking like right now, 
And instead of us being all in the same nation, in fact, this time we're not all in the same nation, but in many companies, most of the team is in the same nation, but this would be some of the team members doing some of the task would be sitting abroad and earning one tenth or one twentieth of the wage. Sitting in a country where $5 an hour is a middle-class income. And that's gonna be, I think, upsetting for a lot of people. Now, this telemigration is not new, but many people aren't familiar with it. So I brought with me tonight a couple of videos, very short videos, but one of them, the first one, is gonna illustrate low-end telemigration. And it's done by The Economist magazine. So The Economist magazine calls this the human cloud, which, which is essentially telemigration. Now the sound isn't very good, but you can read along with the words. This lasts about a minute, so here. person living here in Kibera, how would I have gotten a job for a person in America? takeaway from that is at the end, the Kenyan government is training a million workers a year to join this gig economy, this global gig economy. Now, what, uh, what the, the, lead, the, lead, the leading actor in that or the leading uh, character in that video was doing was a very low end job, very unskilled. And so it's a, it's a threat to a certain type of office worker in rich countries, but pretty much at the low end. The next video is offshoring or telemigration at a much higher level. And this is a threat for professional jobs. And this is an example that comes from the world of IT and coding, but it goes much further. So I, was at, I gave a version of this talk to a law firm in London and the, one of the partners came up to me and says that he had offshored to Kenya and South Africa about 20% of the legal work. And the same thing is going on in writing uh, f financial reports and, and other things. So this telemigration is competing at a higher end. Here. I'm Adrian McDermott, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Product Development for Zendesk. Zendesk is a cloud-based customer service platform. Currently, we have engineering teams in Copenhagen, Dublin, Melbourne, and Singapore. We have a large support presence in Manila. We had a need to build a team that focused on integration, so finding people with very diverse skills and knowledge of other people's software. The market in the Philippines in terms of developers is basically owned by Upwork. Everyone is either on Upwork or Upwork curious. It was clear to So as you might have guessed, this video was done by Upwork, which is a big platform for online work. So in essence, these platforms, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, these are the container ships of globalization of office jobs. It's like eBay, where you can find somebody who wants to sell something and somebody wants to buy, and the, and the platform under mediates all that with the financial transaction and the quality guarantee. So this Upwork is the largest platform growing about 20% per year. It went public last year and now it's worth over a billion dollars. So this type of work is, a, uh, is competing for tasks done by higher level people. So it's not just that. Oops, there we go. Now this is white collar robots. And again, there's a high end and low end. Let's start with the low end. A classic part of this, which is really software automation is called robotic process automation or RPA. And if you have not heard of RPA, you should look it up because it's changing the way offices are run all around the world at a very rapid pace. One of the largest companies that does it is Blue Prism. Um, and there's, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. 
Now, this is a picture of the white collar robot. And you can see why it doesn't feature in uh, news, news feeds. It's just not sexy. It is a piece of software. In particular, it's like a macro that you would write in a, a spreadsheet. So just to give you an example of how this works. When I, when I launched my book in the United States or I went on a book tour in the United States, I wanted to change my cell phone service to include local calls in the United States. So I sent an email to Swisscom, my, my provider, and somebody at Swisscom opened up that email, saw what I wanted, went on to the subscriber database, changed my subscription to include local calls in the United States, closed that database, went over to the billing database, opened it up, changed my billing to include the local calls, shut it down, and then moved on to the next email. This RPA does exactly that with exactly the same software, but 100 times faster and more reliably if it has read the email correctly. Now, this is nothing revolutionary about it, except the fact that now computers can pretty reliably open up a random email and figure out what's wanted, especially if it's an email coming into the subscriber service at Swisscom, where it's not actually an infinite number of possibilities coming out. But this job is replacing lots and lots of office work that we're uh, companies have different databases for billing, for customers, for all sorts of uh, things, and they have people who kind of keep them in line. So this is replacing that. There's also a high-end. This is a high-end uh, white-collar robot, and they're all basically AI platforms, and artificial intelligence platforms. Now, this one is called Amelia, and it has a very presentational, um, uh, what do you call that, um, you know, not a robot, the, uh, Anyways, it, it, it talks and it moves and it animates interactions between humans and the AI platform. Um, Avatar, that's the Avatar, word. Avatar, great. Yeah, and uh, so- oh, Like, like uh, Gigino Di Maio, basically, okay? There you go, there okay. you go. <laughs> and, and so uh, there is a human um, model behind the Avatar. Her name is Amanda. So if I forget to tell you the story of Amelia and Amanda, it's a very touching one, uh, uh, remind me at the end and, I, and I'll tell you that. But anyways, most of them, you've heard of them like IBM Watson, many companies have these big platforms and they're doing things like finding fraud in the trucking department or giving uh, financial advice or sorting out more efficient logistics systems. So they're really high end and they're doing some of the tasks done, like, including by journalists and by lawyers, by doctors, and so these, this office automation is a challenge and an opportunity at a much higher level of jobs. So this is not just low-end jobs. It's also high-end jobs. Lawyers in London, for example, are being, to a, to a large extent, uh, the, the incoming lawyers are being replaced to a large extent by a lot of this kind of e-discovery online uh, software robots. Okay. By about this Re replacing lawyers is a great contribution to mankind, so we should be <laughs> grateful for, for that. Okay, thank you. That's a, I guess that's what Shakespeare said first thing we kill <laughs> off the lawyers, right? Exactly. Um, but I'm afraid today they would say economists, so that's a, um, now I, I think probably by this time you have wondered whether I've actually said anything new. You know, of course, we've had automation, we've had globalization. Why is this time any different? And in fact, Digital technology has really been rip roaring since about 1990. So why is this time different? Why is it new? And the next few slides, I want to share with you why I believe it really is different. Why the future, the next 10 years, will be very unlike the last 10, 20 years. So here we go. I have a number of points. The first, and I mentioned this briefly, it's affecting service and professional jobs, not just factory jobs. Now, if you look at the people at the top of the screen, those people, for the most part, have never experienced automation because until recently, computers couldn't think. And they never expect to experience globalization since most of their jobs required some form of face-to-face -face or local cultural knowledge. Now, they're gonna be facing both automation and globalization moving at a breakneck speed. I think that will make them upset. And there, there's also, 80 or 90% of the workers in our society now are like the ones at the top. Now, the ones at the bottom, there's nothing new. They've been competing with robots at home and China abroad for decades. So you can't teach them anything about it. In any case, there aren't many of them left because they've all been either offshored or automated away. So 
Office workers and professional workers are different. As I mentioned, there's lots of them. Interestingly enough, they're easier to reemploy than factory workers to a certain extent because they're already in cities and there's a lot of service jobs in cities. The second thing is the skill set for most service jobs have quite a bit of overlap. Unlike if you've been working at a Ford foundation, a Ford factory in Janesville, Wisconsin for most of your life and you lose your job, there's nothing else for you to do that's even remotely like that. But even though it's easier to reemploy, many times there'll be downgrade unemployment. So they might have been a, a middle level manager in say a publishing company. And when they get offshore, they have to do something, they get a job, but it's not as well paid and maybe not as interesting. So, uh, the, 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 but the big thing in terms of the upheaval is these people are not ready for globotics. COVID-19 changes things, four things. First of all, lots of people are already fired. And that matters because firing somebody is totally different than rehiring them. So many companies, large bits of the service sector, especially in uh, the United States, have a tabula rasa. And when they bring these people back, they have the option of hiring foreigners by offshoring and automating. So it's a completely different situation. Second, COVID-19 forced an emergency digital transformation that's lasting and massive. We have all learned to work with remote teams. Managers have learned how to deal with remote teams. Customers have learned to deal with services being provided by remote teams. Everybody's invested in lots of kit. They've learned how to keep the data online and secure. They've learned how to use the software and everybody did it at the same time. And since COVID broke through the coordination problem that was always keeping the digital transformation just over the horizon. Number three, social distancing, which will be with us for a while, has raised the relative cost of in-person workers versus white collar robots and telemigrants. So right now, many companies who are going back to the office, they have an A team and a B team because they don't have enough office space to get everybody in at the same time. Now in that kind of setting, if you are on the margin between using RPA to replace some of the workers or offshoring some of the things, this will push you towards automation, a globotic solution. And lastly, many firms are now and will be under extreme cross, cross pressure. And so they may undertake some of this offshoring and outsourcing, which maybe they were thinking about already, but now they have the perfect excuse and they have a big incentive to do it. Number two, Digitech is ICT, uh, Information and Communication Technology, but. So ICT was applied mostly to manufacturing, which was mostly physical manufacturing, with a bit of I and a bit of C. Digital technology is applied to services, which is mostly I and a bit of physical uh, and, and C, and only a little bit of physical. And that matters because different physics applies. So when you're talking about digitization, globalization, automation of manufacturing, the laws of Maddox, the physics of matter applied which means things can only go so fast. And you're talking about digitization and automation offshoring of services, it's mostly about electrons and photons. And the physics of electrons is very different than the physics of matter. Just to dial that in a little bit more concretely, think about how long it takes to double the amount of imports and exports across the border. And the answer is for the average G7 country, two decades. The amount of flow of information across borders is doubling every two years and has for the last 10 years and probably will for the next 10 years. So we're, if you've been using a mindset based when globalization doubles every two decades, to think about the globalization of the future where the flows are doubling every two years, I would suggest you're using the wrong physics and are likely to make some mistakes. Number three. Today's AI is different. So in 2019, 2020, computers can read, write, see, speak, understand speech, create visual output, recognize subtle patterns. And in 2015, they couldn't. So the question is, what changed? My answer is the programming is different. Now, many of you, probably all of you will have seen or read this book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, 
by the psychologist Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in economics. We're still upset about that. You know, there's only so many prizes. Yeah, was, and they gave it yes, it was a, a wound in, in our, you know, what was that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, thinking slow is what most of us think of as thinking. So let's say you want to work out the 15% tip on a $127 restaurant bill in New York. That's thinking slow. It's painful. It's effortful. You know you're doing it. But most importantly, you know how you do it. And as a consequence, you could write a computer program code to do exactly the same thing, which is why computers have no problem doing arithmetic, because we understand how we do arithmetic. Therefore, we can teach a computer to do arithmetic. Thinking fast is a very different type of thinking. So let's suppose you're, you're on your cell phone and you're walking down the stairs. You recognize that there's a cat on the video. You stumble and you catch yourself all at the same time. Now that would require a supercomputer to do all that, but you did it effortlessly. You did it instantly. You did two things at the same time, but most important is you have no idea how you did it. And as a consequence, in the old days, when we taught computers to do things with computer programs, you could not teach a computer to run across uneven, uh, a robot to run across uneven ground. Now we're co programming computers with machine learning, which is a completely different way of programming. So what machine learning is, is you take a big structured data set. And what I mean by structured data set is it's data where the question is clear and the outcomes are clear and ranked and you then estimate an enormous non-linear statistical model making guesses where you throw in a bunch of data, it makes a guess, this is Richard Baldwin's face, therefore you can let him in through, through immigration, yes or no. Now, because it's programming in a different way, it's given computers a whole set of cognitive capacities that they never had before. And some of those are useful in the office. So this is what has opened the gate to the automation of many service sector jobs, which were impossible before about 2016, because computers were taught to do things with coding. That meant we couldn't do things like recognize face or language or translation. We just didn't know how to do that stuff. And we still don't. You still don't understand what the algorithm does. It's too complex, but it's, it often does a good job. Number four, Globotics is advancing at an explosive pace of Digitech. The past transformations were much slower. And I won't go through that. There's a whole bunch of history. I love history, but nobody, nobody wants to read my versions of history. But uh, anyway, so it's all in there if you want to see with the steam engine and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, I want to make this point using an analogy. So <clears throat> with these three, look first uh, at the Apollo 11 picture. That was 1969, and I can see Carlo Alberto was old enough. Uh, he has the same hairdresser as I do. Yep. Uh, to remember that on TV, that back when there was a TV. Uh, 1969, amazing. Now, the computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon and back took up about an entire room. And it was one of the fastest supercomputers on the Earth at the time. Now, let's go forward to another supercomputer, the iPhone 6S, which came out in 2015. Do you know how much faster the processor is in the iPhone 6S than the supercomputer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon and back? Just stop me when I get there. 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, a million times. The answer is it's 120 million times faster than that. That's amazing. But you want to know what's even more amazing? In 2017, the iPhone 10 came out and it is two and a half times faster than the iPhone 6S. And that means in terms of processing speed, there was more progress between 2015 and 2017 than there was between 1969 and 2015. And guess what happened in 2019? Another iPhone came out, the iPhone 11, which was twice as fast again. So this kind of explosive advance of digital technology is changing things. Actually, mostly they've only used it for, for, the, for the photos, but still the photos are amazing. Okay, automation and globalization are happening together. In the past transformation, automation started long before globalization. So steam 
led to mechanization long before it led to better transportation. And ICT led to robot controlled, uh, computer controlled robot arms about two decades before it launched the uh, offshoring and outsourcing revolution. This one I think is really important. It's coming faster than most believe, but strangely enough, it's predicted, but continues to be unexpected. And we even have a name for it. We call it digital disruption. So how can that be? Intelligent people know Moore's law. Moore's law has been working on since Richard Nixon was president and it hasn't really changed that much, but people continue to get disrupted. So I have built a little piece of intellectual architecture to explain to myself why that problem, that mistake can continually go on. Here it is. So I'm gonna give you a little chart. That's, that's sophisticated mathematics, my friend. There you go, yes. <laughs> Progress is on the vertical axis, years on the horizontal axis. And I'm gonna assert that humans think instinctively about progress in a straight line because our brains evolved to track motion in a walking distance world. So basically you think, well, tomorrow will be a little bit like today or a little bit the difference between today and tomorrow. So you're in essence straight lining the future instinctively, but that's not how digital technology works. Digital technology goes slowly, very, very slowly, or it looks very slowly because it's doubling, but very low. And then all of a sudden it starts rising at an incredibly fast pace. And eventually it hits some sort of diminishing returns and levels off. Now, the difference between how digital technology actually progresses and how humans naturally think about progress leads to what I call the holy cow moment. <laughs> this is when like, oh, I, I knew it was changing. I just couldn't believe it would come so fast. And in the book, I have some quotes of CEOs who are now former CEOs who knew the digital transformation was coming. They just didn't realize it would come so fast because they were fooled by it. Now, this actually has a name in digital in, in, in digital uh, uh, world, it's called Amara's Law. Uh, but anyways, let's keep going. Now, how much time do I have left, uh, Carlo Alberto? Uh, I would say five to seven minutes, not more, because okay. we need to keep, keep space for, for a question, please. Perfect, I only have an hour and a half left, so that should all work, just easy. <laughs> so coming in ways that you expect. So this is what I wanted first talk about, Think tasks, not occupations. There's a big discussion, which jobs will go. Actually, what Globotics will do will change the nature of almost every service sector job, but eliminate very few because there's some irreplaceable aspects of almost every single job. And the way I think about it is farmers and tractors. So tractors eliminated a lot of the need for farmers by taking over some tasks, but you still need farmers. It won't look like a factory closure. And this is one of the classic mistakes that people are using the past two decades of globalization and automation to think about the future. So they think it's gonna be like you close a factory, everybody's sad, they go home, maybe they uh, get on unemployment or disability the rest of the lives. This is gonna look like downgrade unemployment, not mass unemployment, Rust Belt style. It's gonna look like this, iPhone infiltration. So I wanna use this analogy of how the iPhone came into our life. If you look about seven, eight years ago, the iPhone, I, I have one of them here. Here's one of the original iPhones. Uh, it only did three things. It was a good music player. It was amazing to have your digital collection online. It was a mediocre phone with a short battery life. <laughs> and it was a web browser, which wasn't much good because there wasn't Wi-Fi anywhere. But one innovation at a time, one advance at a time, it started becoming our ticket agent, our news agent, our social media, our email hub. It started coming into our work lives. But here's the thing, nobody decided to let that happen. It just happened. And for a long time, we didn't even recognize it was happening because it was based on millions or billions of seemingly uncoordinated individual choices, which collectively over just five years completely trans transformed our lives. And I would submit to you that that's how Globotics will come into our offices. It won't be a traumatic thing. It will be one task at a time being automated offshore, but gradually in another five years, we'll go, how did we ever get along without them? Just like we say about our iPhones. 
Job displacement is the business model. This is different than in globalization. Digitech is driving job displacement. That's what the AI geniuses are doing. They're training machine learning algorithms to replace particular workers. Human ingenuity is driving job creation, but human ingenuity doesn't advance at the pace of digital technology. So the real problem is the mismatch in speed. The job displacement is driven by digital technology. Job replacement is driven by human ingenuity. So I'll skip over some of these things. Let me just get to the, the future of work. So telemigration is gonna work because the wage gaps make it possible and Digitech is now making it possible and COVID has advanced that enormously. I'm gonna skip over some of the actual reasons why just in the, because I wanna get the questions rather than just lecture. But I would not forget about machine translation because machine translation will mean hundreds of millions of talented office workers will now be speaking good enough English, French, Italian, whatever. And it's getting better all the time. So the flood of unskilled workers who worked in factories in the 90s will now be a flood of service workers in the 2020s. Okay, future jobs. Good news is there will be all the jobs we need eventually. <laughs> and we can't know their names. That's the, that's the big mistake that people think they can know their name. But think about 1850 when people were leaving the farm, they knew where they're going to industry, but they had no idea they're gonna work in the pharmaceutical industry because there wasn't a pharmaceutical industry. And then when they left the factories to go to the offices, they had no idea what their, their jobs would be because nobody knew we needed all these services that we now absolutely can't live without. But we can guess their nature. And I would suggest we use a process of elimination. Globots will do what they can do. We will do what Globots can't. So the jobs of the future will be filled with tasks that Globots can't do. So the question is, what can't Globots do? And as it turns out, AI can't do human. The most human things, empathy, creativity, innovation, managing teams, motivating people, ethics, all those things AI has trouble doing because they can't get big data sets on it, at least not now. And also our brains, we're social geniuses. We are evolved to have a social connection that uh, computers so far can't reproduce. One-on-one, -on -one, they, they can do it, but not in groups. What can't RI do? What telemigrants can't be in the room. That's the only thing they can't do. <laughs> so if you think about it, long run future of work is gonna be more human, and more local because everything else would be done by Globots. So the jobs of the future will involve lots of human soft skills and they will require people to actually be in the room with other people because otherwise you can hire somebody who costs one tenth as much. I hope we'll be a richer, more generous society if we manage the transition and that's what the upheaval is about. I'm worried about the transition. So I'll just stop right there and look forward to your questions. Great job. That could not be uh, delegated to robots, uh, so far at least. Thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, yes, yes, a fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, travel across time and space. I shall start with Fabio, uh, because Fabio's argument is, is the fundamental critique or at least limitation of, of, uh, of your argument. Uh, Fabio's, Fabio's point is, uh, you know, Enrico Moretti, uh, last uh, famous book is Geography of Jobs, uh, says that you know, skilled jobs, creative jobs are non tradable because there is an intrinsic relationship between creativity and proximity. So you need to be in that room or in that San Francisco, or in that New York or in that Milano, uh, whatever, in order to produce this magic of creativity. Uh, I would argue also quoting Richard Florida in his, uh, you know, uh, argument that creativity is a place eventually. So you already stated that the new division of labor is not black and white. It's gonna be chopped down into small pieces, tasks. Some tasks will go globalics, some other will stay human. But I leave the argument and the answer to you and uh, whatever Fabio can repl replicate, I'm ready to, to, uh, to pass it on. Please, uh, Richard. Sure. So the way I think about it is that, and let me just put it in the context of COVID. What COVID did, especially when we were all locked down, 
was run a whole bunch of experiments as to what can be done remotely. In fact, almost everything is, at least in the uh, service sector, even creative jobs, were forced to be online. And we found out some things worked, some things didn't. Need them. But there's no doubt that the frontier of what's offshoreable, what's remote, is further out than it was before. So the way I think about it is that what we're doing is we're learning what parts of our job actually require us to be in person. Now, in my book, I have a whole chapter where I think about evolutionary so 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 uh, psychology and sociology and the, the, the role of us as humans, uh, social animals, and how that has changed our brain and how we interact how that means that some types of activities really do require face-to-face. -face. So one of them, and this innovation is a classic. So McKinsey, for instance, has a report on what tasks can be done and innovations way down there. Education's as well. So you, you and me, us professors, we're okay so far. But um, it, it's got to do with trust, the way we establish trust. I think this is a kind of a fascinating thing. So as it turns out, humans, maybe not modern humans, but the humans, uh, homos, uh, not homo sapiens, didn't talk until pretty recently. But social skills, the ability to coordinate in large groups is what allowed Homo erectus to, and Neanderthals to survive and uh, survive against animals which were much tougher than we were. Now, that meant that they were communicating without words. So they were using facial expressions and body image and even smell and that nonverbal communication is incredibly important in establishing trust. So as it turns out, we have two tracks. So we have this ancient lizard brain, which is sending messages to your face and your body, which is difficult to control. So when people look for lie tests like experts, they're looking for a mismatch between what your face is saying and what your mouth is saying, because it's easy to lie with your words, much more difficult with your face. So when you have need for trust, you actually have to be in the room with them because some of these things, these micro expressions are so fast they don't come across on things like Zoom. So anyways, I, I talk about a lot about that except the idea that not everything can be offshore. Moreover, I've been talking about it as a threat. So for, for some people, this is an export opportunity. So people are really good at their job in the service job this globalization is actually opening up more opportunity. And so it's a, it's a plus, but for many, many of the people it's a competition. So the innovative people I think will be, you know, uh, validated by this. Thank you, Richard. Now it comes along a question, a very much uh, uh, relevant question for you as an international economist. Taxation, my friend. <laughs> because we can get rid of robots, but not of tax men. Right. Uh, if remote, well, that's a, a question from Depa. Uh, if remote working moves more colors, well, white collar jobs, out of the jurisdiction of uh, tax authorities, so out of developed economies, what could be the taxation effect? C can it be rebalanced in one way, I would, yeah, something like protectionism of digital uh, workers, uh, any other macroeconomic option to, you know, keep in balance the, the, the need to preserve the tax pools on, on, on developed countries versus the, the shifting of uh, value added somewhere else. What's your, what's the point of view? Sure. So it is a big problem. Um, I, I, uh, I, I asked, I was, I was at Davos a couple of years ago and I met the CEO of Upwork, one of these big platforms. And I asked him that question because I thought that eventually there'll be a revolution against these platforms because of the tax dodging. Now, what he told me, he was a French socialist guy and they're, they're like a do-gooding company. <laughs> he says, it's not hopeless. And what they do, for instance, for the US freelancers is they issue a 1099, which is a miscellaneous income to their freelancers and they know where their freelancers are, or at least they know where their bank is. And because of no customers, if you have a bank account that you're paying into, you actually know which jurisdictions there's in. And so what, what Upwork does is tell the government where they're working, how much is done if they get asked. So I, I told him this example of Sri Lanka, where all the, all the IT workers are working on Upwork, none, none of them in the local economy. And I said, well, what do you do about that? And he says, well, the Sri Lanka government doesn't ask me, so I don't tell them. But the U.S. government insists, so the U.S. government is not. So in principle, what we need is a kind of best practice pact 
among the Upwork the platforms to, in, to reveal the income where it's earned. Now, there is an issue, uh, you know, it, whether it's paid in Italy or whether it's paid <laughs> in, in Pakistan, but in any case, at least somebody could know. And then you could have double taxation treaties, you could work on it. But I think the, the, there's also uh, facial recognition. You could find out who's actually online. But the, the key here is that you have to make a deposit in a bank. And because of know your customers, that lets you pin it down and actually gives you very precise information as to how much it is. So it's solvable, but it hasn't yet been addressed. And you could throw into that pot labor, abuse of labor, child labor, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's the same problem and there's no factory to go visit. So it, it's the same problem. The ILO is actually working a little bit on this, on, on the unfairness of platform economies. Yeah, but it's a great I, question. I, I, I've been through a, a debate with some of the union represented here in Italy about this, uh, the protection of workers against uh, too much uh, remote work. So the inability to, to unplug yourself, uh, to get you know, longer hours, to get exploitation at the end of the day. So let me rephrase the same argument, not on the taxation side, but on the, on uh, you know on uh, protection of uh, workers' rights because we we are worried about the fact that that uh, you may really exploit labor without any control. Uh, one of the example I made uh, was uh, truck drivers that in Europe are uh, basically su surveyed by the fact that they have a. a, 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 a um, a computer a board that you know that that you know runs through the, the you know hours of driving and the hours of of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, stopping and so we're working around this replacing this this problem of, of uh, truck drivers with the same software solution to be installed in the computer of remote workers to protect them against exploitation. I would like to have your argument about that. Do you, do you think it's a, is a, a, a good idea or is, is it feasible? Is it, is, is it also something that would help comp companies to you know, abide by the rules, to, to get protected because they follow the rules, they respect the, the, the rights of the workers? Yeah, so let me take that in two bits. So it's good for the work for firms because if everybody's doing it, it doesn't lead to a competitive loss against other firms. So, if, if, so it really yeah. should be a law. The second thing, as I build it out a little bit more, digital technology has disintegrated the traditional workplace relationship and the traditional workplace contract. But unfortunately, or fortunately, over most of the post war period, a huge amount of our social system is built on jobs, traditional jobs. Uh, and also get unemployment insurance and all that is based on traditional jobs. But digital technology has allowed firms in, in, and encouraged firms to essentially disintegrate the contract and make it piecework, basically. Now, what all that means is we need a new set of laws. When we, when we went from the factories in the, in the days of Charles Dickens, when it was a horrible thing, we got laws to regulate factories. And you know, maybe at first they said, well, how will we know that they're doing in the factories? So we had factory inspectors. And then they had, you know, they put bosses in jail if they were too abusive. So we just need to do the same thing with digital work. And there is hope for it, but because exactly it's digital, everything is written down. Everything in principle yes. can be recorded. Be Everything recorded can be and tracked and controlled and yes. therefore supervised. Okay. Right. So it's, it's not like we can't control this. It's just we haven't yet written. The statistics are completely wrong. The taxation. Yeah. Metrics, uh, you know, or, you know all the performance things. indicator needs to be. I mean, maternity leave for Uber drivers. You know, well, so much of our social welfare system is designed around people having traditional jobs. And more and more, there's not traditional jobs. So I would, I would build it out that we need a new set of labor laws to deal with a world where we're most, many, many workers are no longer on traditional contracts in traditional relationships with a single employer. Yeah. Let me sell the next uh, Dialogo dei Copernicani exactly on this point. Uh, on the 1st of October, 1st October, autonomia e subordinazione, quale... Uh, progetto di lavoro, qualche, quale progetto di legge per i rider. So what is this, this balance, this equilibrium between autonomy, subordination, control, freedom, and of course, protection, uh, and, uh, and, but also on the, on the side of the employer, uh, you know, not being, uh, not being cheated by those who don't follow the rules. 
So next 1st of October, exactly on this point, join us uh, on uh, the Copernicani discussion. Quindi vedi Patrizia che ho già venduto la prossima cosa. I, wanna, I want you to develop this argument, uh, uh, Patricia, because it's so essential. On one side, we're going down to the unbundling of labor. We, we're chopping down processes into small pieces, formalize them and delegate it to the cloud, basically, okay? Uh, human tasks uh, become uh, robotic uh, uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. So the disaggregation of tasks uh, uh, is a great favor to robots because it makes them simpler and it makes them uh, easier to manage. But uh, there is a, an, another level, probably that your next book. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> a, few years, a few years ago, I, we, I may challenge because a few years ago, I wrote a, a short essay the name, uh, the title was The Age of Orgware. Not hardware, not software, but Orgware. What is Orgware? Mm -hmm. A challenge to your or original point, okay? Uh, the subtitle was Invisible Machines and Artificial Organization, and he got it, okay? Because my argument was easy, easy peasy to unbundle labor because we've been doing it for centuries in industrial application. Less so in services, but we learn. Much more difficult is to aggregate artificially human processes. That's what I call artificial organization, which is not one task to be delegated. It's a process to be redesigned. So I challenge you to write the next book, or you are already a serial writer and <laughs> read Netflix. Okay, the next book we write together, and we write not about globotics, okay, but about artificial organization, that is robots organizing themselves. <laughs> uh, because they, they learn how to interact. You, we, we have studied the robotic collusions of uh, um, artificial intelligence system for price of, of uh, fuel in Germany, okay? <laughs> because those bastards look on each other and they learn how to collude in stepping up the price instead of going down. This is incredible. And how can you blame? You don't call the antitrust authority and put some robot in jail. It's impossible. Okay. <laughs> but this fact taught me a, a very important element. Robots are learning not just to copy our job. Those bastards are learning to organize themselves. So I am asking you this fundamental question. Fine for this unbundling of labor, new division of labor, tasks being uh, disaggregated and delegated. It's a great job, okay. But what about reaggregation? What about artificial intelligence, not on single tasks, but rather on a sequence of processes, an entire value chain going artificial, Richard? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a uh, an issue, and um, uh, just to give an example, I don't know if it's happened to you, but. Cortana is starting to give me a daily email that looks through all my emails and thinks she, yeah. she has no idea of my, my, my life is so d disorganized and so many things going on. She always has it wrong, but she's trying yeah. to organize my life. So right. I, I, I do think it's a really- Exactly realistic. like that. Okay. Right. But Those another, metrics are telling you how you're working, how, how many people you're touching. It's trying to figure out your disorganization, okay? Right, right. Uh, but and they're getting there, okay? So shall we hide away and go on a logic or shall we jump on it and, and, and try to design the governance of this factor? So, so let me give you one more anecdote which you may use in this, this in the future. I don't know if you've ever seen that experiment where robots, computer robots started talking to each other. Yeah. And then they slipped into a quasi language, which wasn't English. They started with English and then they started developing the shorthand back and forth, which they understood. Yeah, the it, it happens also in the Italian parliament sometimes. Uh, and they, they, <laughs> there is a strange language going on. And sometimes they can understand each other. Unbelievable. Huh? So <laughs> let's finish, finish your argument story. Okay. But so I, I, what I like to look at is, is companies like Snapchat, where there's actually very few people in the company but they're all in the same building. And what they're doing is coordinating AI and RI to get tasks done, spinning it up, spinning it down. And I think that's what our role is, will be put together. And I would like to spin it to a hopeful thing. 
So think about this, and I want to take a, a broad historical perspective. When mechanization first came in, in the 1700s, it was giving more power to manpower. So actually for almost a century, inequality fell up until about 1970, as it gave better tools for people who work with their hands, but it didn't give much to people who work with their heads. And when ICT came along, a computer on a chip was invented in 1973, that started making better substitutes for people who work with their hands and better tools for work with their heads. And we had this long increase in inequality. Now, AI is a substitute for wisdom yeah. and experience. So I believe that AI will eventually be a huge equalizer. It will lead a rise of the middle class again. So think about it this way. Suppose yeah. you're a nurse with a really good diagnostic tool. It makes the doctor a little bit more productive, but it makes the nurse way more productive. And I think what we're going to find is semi-professional jobs that are between nurses and doctors, between draftsmen and architects, between lawyers and paralegals, where the less, uh, less educated, less qualified person has the benefit of 20 or 30 years experience coming with an algorithm. And therefore, they're more relatively more productive. Now, the, the big chefs, of course, they're going to also be more productive. But the main point here is that artificial intelligence, the canned wisdom that comes with it is more valuable to average people than it is to really clever people. So personally, I think AI will be a great equalizer of incomes by creating a whole set of skilled jobs that do not require 10 years of university or 10 years of training or 10 years of experience because you just dial up the app and you can, can uh, do a diagnosis. It's not perfect, but then again, nothing is. You're praising robotic socialism, my friends. Maybe you're right, sir, but there are only, only two places to be in the next future. Whether you are in the room or you're in the cloud, there is no other place in between. Uh, let me make you uh, the final question about Pat. Uh, uh, she's asking you your comment about uh, the, which model of capitalism has reacted uh, to the simultaneous shock of uh, COVID uh, and, uh, and, and, and this evolution. So, What's, what's your, because my, my, my experience is that South Korea, Taiwan did it much better, okay? Yeah. Stay, being a, a democratic society and a great management, great integration and great responsibility. European did it badly. I want to talk about the Americans, of course. It's, it's right. out, of, out of, I don't know about your opinion about this. So my view, I would stick a little bit closer. I, I think the key is there's actually nothing new about the job aspect of this. People have to change jobs as they have in the past, but just more of them and faster. So what we really need is gov more government policies that look after workers, not jobs, like Denmark. So for me, it's Denmark, flex security. But Hire fire seen. as you need, but the, each Box, and every worker yeah. knows society is gonna look after them. So I think the big problem is that this digital technology in some countries, the United States, presumes that the burden of adjustment falls on the workers, when in fact, it's a societal thing. Yep. So the society should change, should share part of the burden of the adjustment, if nothing else, for pure welfare perspectives. So I think what we really need is more active labor market policies. I wouldn't go all the way to universal basic income, but I think we have to worry about yep. helping people change jobs and retrain and have the confidence to go out and try something new. And now, for example, if you lose your job, and you have to move house because the housing market is all messed up, you can't. So you have to take whatever job you can get locally. And there's a million little things like that that have to change to give the economy more flexibility to allow people to move into the jobs that will be created going forward in the service sector. And let me just reiterate that actually it's less difficult than taking people from factories and trying to put them in. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's moving different. You know, you're in the insurance industry, you go into the uh, the software industry, whatever. It's not that different. And so that's why I, I'm optimistic, but we really do need to change the reliance of social policies on a work contract and an employer worker relationship, and then provide more external, you know, safety net, active labor market policy in order to help people transit. Now, if that doesn't work, I think we're going to see some backlashes that are trying to slow it down. So using regulations, especially privacy regulations, to prohibit, prohibit this. And if worse comes to worse, they could maybe make it difficult to fire people because that will slow down the whole thing. Now, those are terrible outcomes, much better to let people adjust. 
But I think if people get upset enough, like they did in the 70s, we'll get feather bedding, we'll get red flag laws, we'll get like what happened with the longshoremen when we got containers, there'll be pushbacks, uh, hopefully not too radical, but pushbacks against the changes, unless governments take take hold and create a new social contract, if you want to say it that way. Great. We're almost done. Patricia, I think we are running out of time. There is a final fundamental technological question. Uh, can you tell something about the blue black, black background behind you? Is that digital or is it just real? Is that <laughs> the fundamental challenge in our mind? Uh, ah, bellissimo. Bravo. I, I had to buy this. Can you, can you get it on Amazon.com? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ah, great, it, great. It, it even folds up. And on the yeah. other side, it's green. You, yeah, you, so it's and that so. green. Bellissimo. It's already, you know, Greta Thunberg oriented. Bravo. Here we go. Here we okay. go. Here we go. Green on Fantastic. The other side. And you have all the pictures of the family behind. Great. <laughs> uh, let me say a final element. There is only one economic factor in the world with infinite supply, and that is scarcity. So don't fear for the lump of labor fallacy, my friends. Uh, there will always be more job opportunity than robots. So I, I think that Richard will share this point of view, okay? Perfect. Grazie, Richard. Grazie, grazie, grazie. You are a great, brilliant guy. I think you make a great career. I tell you, I, I tell you, <laughs> I, I know the future. You'll make a great professor, maybe, okay? Thank, thank, thank you, you very much, much. Patrizia. You have the floor. Primo di ottobre, primo di ottobre, autonomia e subordinazione, quale futuro per i nostri riders? And we will, you know, keep on the discussion about this polarization, room or cloud or bike. Maybe the third place is on the bike, okay? <laughs> Patrizia.